Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I'll be talking about a few different reactions of alkenes, including the oxidation and alkylation of those double bonds. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are, how can I convert alkenes to epoxides and diols? How do I cleave an alkene using ozone? How can I convert alkenes to cyclopropanes? And how do I reduce alkenes to alkanes? If you'd like some review on the properties of alkenes or some of the other reactions that they undergo, please go ahead and subscribe and take a look at my other videos on that. The first reaction I'd like to talk about is the epoxidation of alkenes, and this is also known as the Prilizhaev reaction. So if we take a very simple alkene, like propene, and treating it with this compound called MCPBA in dichloromethane will give us this epoxide where we've added the oxygen across the double bond, converting that to the cyclic epoxide, and then we have this methyl group again because we're epoxidizing propene. I can draw the structure of MCPBA here. It stands for meta-chloroperoxybenzoic acid. So although that's a mouthful, this is the structure of the oxidant we're going to use. And the important thing about this structure is that we have a peroxy acid. So instead of just a normal carboxylic acid, where we have that CO2H functional group, a peroxy acid has this CO3H functional group with that oxygen-oxygen single bond. The mechanism here is quite satisfying to draw, so we'll start with the propene. And then I'll draw the peroxy acid section of our oxidant with this CO3H group, and I'll just put R instead of drawing out the entire molecule. Because of this peroxide single-single oxygen bond, this second oxygen is going to have a partial positive charge, and that's going to make it susceptible to nucleophilic attack from the alkene. So what we'll have is we'll have the electrons in the pi bond of the alkene go to attack this oxygen here. At the same time, the oxygen-oxygen single bond will swing over to form a double bond to the substrate. This carbon-oxygen double bond will come over to pick off the hydrogen. And finally, the oxygen-hydrogen bond will come to attack the other carbon of the alkene. So this is one concerted process, and what we end up with is the epoxide. So we'll have this three-carbon epoxide here as well as the carboxylic acid analog of the peroxy acid, so now we just have a CO2H byproduct. One problem with MCPBA is its relative danger to use in the laboratory, so we can use a safer and less reactive peroxy acid called MMPP. So this time, let's look at the reaction of trans-2-butene, very simple alkene again, with MMPP, Again, in dichloromethane, maybe as a solvent. And MMPP stands for magnesium monoperoxyphthalate. So I can draw that here. This is a salt of magnesium as well as this anion, with again one of these acid groups being a peroxy acid, so having a CO3H group instead of the CO2H that we normally see. And the product of this reaction is going to be again our epoxide. We have this three-membered ring, and the stereochemistry will be retained. So we have a transalkene as our starting material, so we will end up with the methyl groups trans to each other in the epoxide product. So maybe we can have the right-hand methyl group coming out of the page, and the left-hand going into the page. A useful secondary reaction that we can do is treat this with just H3O+, so an acid in water. And if you remember from my video on the ring openings of epoxides, you should know that the product here will be the diol. So we will have the hydroxyl groups here on vicinal carbons, and we will have the stereochemistry retained. So we have the left-hand methyl group going into the page, and the right-hand methyl group coming out of the page towards us. Because this compound is optically active, we'll also get the enantiomer. So from this sequence of reactions, we'll end up with anti-addition of the vicinal OH groups. So we'll have those OH groups on opposite sides, and on adjacent carbons, vicinal carbons. So this is a useful reaction sequence, first epoxidizing the alkene, and then opening that epoxide under acidic or basic conditions to get anti-addition of those OH groups. 
What if we wanted to get sin addition of those OH groups instead of anti-addition? Well, we can take the same starting material, the trans-2-butene, and treat it in a two-step process, first with osmium tetroxide in THF, so tetrahydrofuran as a solvent, and then following that up with a reductive workup using hydrogen sulfide, H2S, or maybe sodium bisulfite, and this will give us the syn diol. So we'll have the OH groups on the same side of the alkene, again retaining the stereochemistry of the alkene, so we'll have this, maybe this left-hand methyl group coming out of the page, and the right-hand methyl group going into the page, away from us. So we can see that this is the eclipsed conformer of the diol, so if we twist one of these carbons around, we can get this equivalent representation, where the hydroxyl groups are now anti, but now we have the methyl groups on the same side, whereas in the previous reaction, they were on opposite sides, even though we're coming from the same starting material. So this oxidation with osmium tetroxide is a good way to get syn addition of the two OH groups instead of anti-addition. As always, let's look at the mechanism of this. We start with our trans-2-butene, and our osmium tetroxide molecule looks like this with an osmium center. And similar to before, we'll have another paracyclic reaction, so where all these electrons are moving in concert. We'll start with the electrons in the pi bond of the alkene moving to attack one of these oxygens. This osmium-oxygen double bond will swing to where the electrons are now on the osmium, and then another one of these oxygen-osmium double bonds will swing to attack the other carbon of the alkene. And this will give us this cyclic intermediate, where the double bond has broken, and now we have this five-membered ring with osmium and the two oxygens. And again, this will be a syn addition, so we have both of these oxygens on the same side of the hydrocarbon substrate. Finally, reductive workup using maybe hydrogen sulfide will finally give us the diol, so the syn diol with the two OH groups on the same side of the molecule. Because osmium tetroxide is a very expensive reagent, a lot of times we can use a, another oxidant, so maybe hydrogen peroxide, to reoxidize the osmium tetroxide so that we can only use it in catalytic amounts instead of using the osmium tetroxide in stoichiometric amounts, which would become very expensive and produce a lot of heavy metal waste. Our last oxidation reaction that I'll talk about will be ozonolysis. So this is cleaving a double bond using ozone, O3. Let's start with this substituted alkene here and treat it again in two steps, first using ozone, O3, in dichloromethane as a solvent, and following up with dimethyl sulfide, so I can draw that here, that's just sulfur with two methyl groups, or another reducing agent could be zinc metal in acetic acid, and this will cleave the double bond and give us two carbonyl products, so we'll get acetone, our three carbon ketone, as well as acetaldehyde. So again, this is basically cleaving the double bond and replacing the double bond with a carbon-oxygen double bond in each case. Let's look at the mechanism. So again, as always, we'll start with our alkene, and we have our ozone structure here, where we have a positive formal charge on the central oxygen and a negative formal charge on this next oxygen over. The electrons in the pi bond of the alkene will swing over to attack this electrophilic oxygen, the one double bonded to the center. The electrons in this oxygen-oxygen double bond will come to be on the oxygen alone, and finally the lone pairs on this negatively charged oxygen will swing to attack the other carbon of the alkene. And this will give us this five-membered ring intermediate called a malozonide. And this malozonide is very unstable, with this three oxygens all right next to each other. So it's going to decompose very quickly, where we have this bond between the carbons coming up to the oxygen to form a double bond. We'll have the oxygen-oxygen single bond come to be on the oxygen by itself. And then finally the lone pairs on this oxygen will form a double bond to this adjacent carbon. This will give us two products here. One is acetone from the left-hand carbon, and the other is what's called a carbonyl oxide. 
So we have an acid aldehyde base structure, but we also have another oxygen bonded to this oxygen on the carbonyl. Let's fill in the formal charges. We have plus on the oxygen here and minus charge on the bottom oxygen. Now this carbonyl oxide is very reactive again. So we'll have the lone pairs on this oxygen attack the carbon on the acetone. The double bond to oxygen will swing over to attack this electrophilic carbon on the carbonyl oxide. Finally, the double bond to this oxygen will swing up to just be on the oxygen of the carbonyl. And this will form a slightly more stable ozonide, where we still have a five-membered ring with three oxygens, but the arrangement of those oxygen atoms is different. Now we have sort of alternating oxygens and carbons. And finally, reducing this in a workup with dimethyl sulfide or acidic zinc metal will give us the two products, acetone, so the ketone, and acid aldehyde, the aldehyde product. So depending on the substitution of the original alkene, we can get aldehydes or ketones. And we can also get a mixture of two products if we have an asymmetrical alkene or just one product if we have a totally symmetrical alkene. Let's move on from oxidation of alkenes and talk a little bit about their reductions. So if we want to convert an alkene to the corresponding alkane, so with just carbon-carbon single bonds, we can use hydrogen gas. So let's look at propene, our very simple alkene, and treat it with hydrogen gas over a catalyst. And this catalyst can be a couple different things. Very commonly used is palladium on carbon, so this is basically a mixture of very fine charcoal, very fine carbon, with palladium metal on the surface. Or we can also use platinum oxide, PTO2. And this will reduce the alkene to the corresponding alkane. So we'll just get propane as a product. The mechanism for this is a little bit different from the traditional arrow pushing mechanisms we've encountered before. Let's look at it from the perspective of the catalyst surface. So we'll imagine that this surface here is the surface of carbon with palladium metal on it. And as we pass hydrogen gas over this surface, it'll be in equilibrium with this representation where we have the hydrogen atoms bonded to that catalyst surface. Then we'll have the alkene come in and I'll draw specifically all the stereochemistry. So we'll have these three hydrogens as well as the methyl group pointing into the page. And this right-hand carbon will pick up one of the hydrogens. And at the same time, this carbon-carbon double bond, the pi bond, will swing down to the catalyst surface to attach itself. Then finally, this carbon on the left will pick up the remaining hydrogen and leave the catalyst surface to give us syn addition of a molecule of H2 across the double bond. So again, syn addition meaning on the same side of the alkene. So that stereochemistry can be very important in organic synthesis. So what if we take a look at this alkene, where we have a cyclohexene base, and then on the upper carbon we'll have an ethyl group, so I'll just write CH2CH3, and then a methyl group on the bottom carbon. And treating this with hydrogen gas on palladium on carbon, will give us syn addition, remember, of the molecule of H2. So that means that our substituents, our alkyl groups, will be on the same side in the product. So we'll have the ethyl group and the methyl group both coming out of the page towards us. And as usual, this compound is optically active, so we'll end up with a racemate, so plus the enantiomer of this molecule. So this gives us the cis product and not the trans product. Okay, to finish up this rather long video on the couple remaining reactions of alkenes, let's look at cyclopropanation. So we'll start with this cyclohexene alkene and treat it with this compound called diazomethane and using light or heat, so H nu or delta. And this will add a cyclopropane ring to where the double bond was. The mechanism has all to do with the properties of the diazomethane molecule. So we'll draw that here, where the central carbon is bonded to two hydrogens as well as a nitrogen, and this nitrogen is triple bonded to the remaining nitrogen. Now that gives us a lone pair on the carbon with a negative formal charge and a positive formal charge on this adjacent nitrogen. 
and because nitrogen gas n2 is so stable this carbon nitrogen bond will be pretty weak so we can actually cleave it using either light or heat we can draw this carbon nitrogen bond swinging over to the nitrogen evolving nitrogen gas and giving us what is called a carbene so with this ch2 molecule with one lone pair and it is electrically neutral so because the carbene has a sextet so only six electrons around it it is very electron deficient and will readily accept the electrons from this cyclohexene so the pi electrons will come to attack the carbon and at the same time the lone pair on this carbene will attack the other carbon of the alkene and that will very simply just give us the cyclopropane product here. We can form carbenes using a couple of different reagents. Let's look at this molecule, this substituted alkene here, and treat it with chloroform, so CHCl3, and a strong base like potassium terbutoxide. And this will give us this cyclopropane here where we have the two chlorines on the ring carbon, as well as a cis stereochemistry. So we have both of the groups on the alkene coming out of the page towards us. So this carbene is formed again in a slightly different way. So we'll start with the chloroform structure here, with the three chlorines. And then our strong base, the terbutoxide anion, will come in to take off this hydrogen here. And this hydrogen is made unusually acidic because of the three chlorines, which are electron withdrawing. So because this is a strong base, we can take that hydrogen off. The bond to carbon will swing onto the carbon to make a lone pair. And one of the chlorines will come off as a chloride anion. And that will give us what's called a dichlorocarbene intermediate. And from there, the mechanism is exactly the same. So we have the pi electrons attacking the central carbon as well as the lone pair on the carbon attacking the other carbon of the alkene, giving us this dichlorocyclopropane product here. Because diazomethane is so reactive and it is shock sensitive, so it can explode in the laboratory, we can use a slightly safer mixture of reagents to form the cyclopropane products that we want. So if we take propene, and treat it with diiodomethane, so CH2I2, and then a mixture of zinc and copper, and maybe diethyl ether as a solvent, we can form again the cyclopropane with this one methyl group on the side by way of what's called the Simmons-Smith reagent. So this is called the Simmons-Smith reaction, and it involves this reactive intermediate ICH2 zinc iodide. And while I won't draw out the mechanism explicitly, it is useful to know that other methods exist of performing these same reactions using maybe more complicated or catalytic processes. So I hope this video helped you learn something about some of the oxidation and reduction reactions that alkenes undergo. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to my channel, like my page on Facebook, and check out my website on the screen. If you're willing, consider donating to my Patreon page, which really helps me to continue creating all of this content for all of you. Thanks for watching.